Thank you. Uh, welcome to the appellate court morning session, March 10th, second appeal, Lemma v. York and Chapel. I apologize for the five minute delay. Our conference went a tiny bit over. Uh, I would ask that everyone participating in this hearing identify themselves, starting with the judges, then counsel for the appellant, then counsel for the appellee. I am Judge Alvord. I'm Judge Cradle. Judge Evely. Bruce Alstein, Golden Gruder and Woods for the defendant appellant. And Stephen Curley uh, for the plaintiff appellee, Dominic Lemma. Okay, thank you. Counsel, prior to this argument, you received procedural instructions. Do you have any questions about those instructions? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay. As always, each side will have 20 minutes. The appellant has, may, has the opportunity to uh, reserve a portion of the 20 minutes for rebuttal time. Let me know when you introduce yourself if you'd like to do that. I'd just like to remind you that our arguments are live streamed uh, on YouTube and just please be cognizant of that in the event that there is uh, any sort of protected information uh, that you might be discussing and uh, please don't do that. Uh, and we are all going to try to remember to mute when we're not speaking. So I think we're ready to go. Attorney Elstein. Uh, may it please the court. My name is Bruce Elstein, Goldman, Gruder and Woods, and I represent York and Chapel in this appeal. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Um, at the outset, I'd like to concede that the submission for arbitration was unrestricted so that we don't need to, uh, to belabor that point. But that's the beginning, uh, but not the end of the inquiry, because even an unrestricted submission is revo reviewable under the manifest disregard of law standard. Um, and I admit that that's a narrow standard, but that's the one we're going to focus on here today. I'm going to discuss and argue three points, unless the court has questions regarding other points. Um, but I'll rely on my brief for the other points. And what I plan to discuss <clears throat> and argue this morning is the failure of the arbitrator to grant a continuance upon a reasonable request to the failure to award uh, my client its fees and costs in the arbitration as required by the underlying contract and that there is no subject matter jurisdiction. The first ground uh, is the failure to grant the reasonable continuance. The facts are set forth in my brief, um, and we're contending that under 52418 subpart A, subpart 3, that the arbitrator was guilty of misconduct in refusing to postpone the hearing upon a sufficient cause shown. Uh, the request that I'm focusing on first was the request that was made upon the arbitrator on, I believe it was a Friday, May 17th, um, for continuance because of the reasons set forth in my brief, which I believe have been read. Um, and the arbitrator, I asked for, for days, you know, I didn't need weeks or months. Um, it was a valid reason. I was going to be out of state for an emotional event. Um, and what the arbitrator did instead, the arbitration hearing had been scheduled for two days, March, I'm sorry, May 22nd and May 23rd. And what the arbitrator did was when we told him that the case was be, would be shorter, it would be one day in total, instead of postponing, um, he just said, you're going to be one day, we'll just go on the second day, the 23rd, giving me little insufficient time to, uh, to attend to the, to the needs that uh, were present at that time. Are you referring to the email that you sent on Friday, May 17th at 6.15 p.m.? I am, Your Honor. And in that email, you state that you're, you anticipate to be out of town Monday and Tuesday, the 20th and the 21st. However, that on that Monday, you'll be working on another mediation in the morning. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. And, uh, and, and then the response of uh, the... Uh, well, there was uh, opposition by your colleague. Um, I get, let's just see here. Or maybe the, I don't. So 
Where, what, can you just point me to in your appendix the exact email responding to that, please? I'm just being sort of picky. This is arbitrator misconduct you're alleging here, so. Yes, I understand. It's. It's just so I'm, I'm seeking that you not paraphrase. It's on page 30 of the appendix. So that page 30 of the appendix, which is your appendix, has your email and where's the responsive email to that Friday night request? It's not contained in my. Um, uh, it wasn't attached as an exhibit, but I believe it was an exhibit to the objection that was filed. Well, where is it in your appendix? I'm looking for it. It is on page 71. Okay, so the Saturday, so the next day, 17th, you have the 18th, okay. This is the one day, oh, Thursday the 23rd, 9 a.m., correct? It is, and I misspoke, there's, there's a response by uh, plaintiff's counsel that preceded this. This is the arbitrator's order. Let me see if I can put my hands on that. You know, it would be a lot easier it, rather than us jumping around if you just put the series of emails in the same spot. But I go ahead. I understand. I, I don't believe that email from my opposing counsel okay. is in the appendix. In any event, the arbitrator who's mis who you are um, alleging um, uh, did his job in, in a misconduct sort of fashion, this is the page A71 where his response to you being out of town on Monday and Tuesday is reducing the hearing to one day to be held on Thursday, May 23rd. Is that correct? That's correct, but there's okay. a fact, but there's a there's an additional fact. You said Monday, Tuesday. My email that I referenced said Monday, Tuesday, or Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. And indeed, it was actually Monday through Wednesday. Is what occurred. Okay, and the, and here's the response. Um, having holding the hearing on May twenty third. Okay, I've got the response here, and then the um. Another lawyer from the firm is the rest of that sentence. Correct. Okay. Got it. I'm, I'm with you. So the sufficient cause is that I, I was going to be out of town and, and tied up with another matter to prepare and present an arbitration hearing. Witnesses need to be um, um, prepared. You need to uh, gather your evidence. And um, only I had the intimate knowledge of the file. The others in my firm did not. Um, and for whatever reason, I continued to believe that I could conduct the arbitration hearing, even with the events that were going on. The, the only time I realized I could not was when I wrote an email uh, on the 22nd um, requesting another continuance, which was then denied. Um, the arbitrator in denying it, um, I think, makes uh, a mistake. Uh, manifest disregard of the sufficient cause that was presented. Um, the whole issue in the arbitration was whether uh, the employee had uh, been terminated for cause or not. And that depended upon the number of hours he was devoting to his work as provided for under the agreement. I had interviewed a witness and had subpoenaed her to the hearing to present evidence that it was her testimony that from and after the signing of the agreement, 
um, Mr. Lemma performed little, if any, work on a weekly basis. And at the hearing, she testified uh, directly contrary to what she had uh, informed me during the interview. Um, I was not there to be able to then cross-examine her on the exact words that she said to me um, in response to the interview and to bring up other facts that surrounded her then current association again with Mr. Lemma. Um, as a result of that, the arbitrator found that uh, Mr. Lemma had not been terminated for cause and provided him the benefits due under the agreement. So the order failing to extend the date hampered my client because the attorney it chose to present the case was unavailable. I said I was unavailable and would be unavailable on Friday. Yes, Your Honor. Hey, counsel, I still don't see how you could find that the arbitrator engaged in misconduct. There's a whole other side to this, too, where a party had also, uh, your opponent had subpoenaed a witness uh, as I recall, the client was traveling en route from, from the West Coast. Uh, there were also issues with respect to uh, counsels uh, being a solo practitioner. So it sounds like they were prepared and ready to go. It appears even from your email uh, on May 17th that there were exhibits that had not been uh, provided uh, to opposing counsel. Um, you know, so it, it sounds like the uh, court or the arbitrator took all of these things into consideration when it, it made its decision not to grant that continuance. I understand that, but but I think the timing is important in responding to that question because I think the timeline, um, it, as you expressed it, is is not entirely accurate. The first request that was made was May the seventeenth. The uh, discussion about the in route and traveling occurred on the twenty second. So that was already self-imposed by by objecting to the continuance that was made on May the 17th. Um, I believe counsel for the plaintiff had not subpoenaed a witness. Indeed, I had subpoenaed a witness um, to be there because we anticipated proceedings. So she had been subpoenaed sometime before I learned of the passing of this friend. So um, we were ready to go, but for that. So that's a self-imposed um, uh, reason when they say that there were, uh, a, a witness was en route, uh, because if the decision had been made in response to the request on the 17th, that hardship would not have presented itself. Now, balancing the, 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 the schedule of the various attorneys, that's a normal part of uh, pr the practice of law. And you can't say that just because he's booked up, that that vitiates the sufficient cause it is under uh, 52.418A3, um, sufficient cause shown. And I think that there was sufficient cause. And yes, there has to be a balancing, I admit that. But in the totality of it, when you look at it in, in the lens of May 17th, that's where the harm occurred. Everything thereafter was self-imposed. And so I think it was manifest. How do, you, how do you arrive at this arbitrator's decision as being misconduct, though, as opposed to you, do, you just, it's a matter of his discretion. You don't agree with the discretion he exercised, but it, it seems you have to jump. This isn't just abuse of discretion. This is misconduct. Where is the misconduct here? Well, I'll, I'll cite your honor to the case. It's in my papers, Allendale Nursing Home versus Local 115. It's a federal um, district court case from 1974. And the facts there were a, uh, a, a union was arbitrating uh, with regard to a union member, I suppose. And what happened was a paralegal who was assisting the union representative fell ill at the commencement of the hearing. She went to the hospital and the arbitrator refused to continue the hearing, saying that the, the union representative could proceed in her absence. That was an, an issue that came up. The court reversed, um, finding that the instrumental person who uh, was needed to be there in order to adequately um, cross-examine the witnesses on the other side, fell ill and was unavailable, and found misconduct sufficient to reverse the decision. 
and I bring that reasoning to our case here, that the failure to grant the continuance is misconduct similar to what was found there because it amounts to a disqualification of the lawyer chosen by my client. My client had hired me. I had done all the work on this arbitration and then was prevented at the last minute from orderly presenting the case. And so that is uh, misconduct, according to the, the court in the Allendale nursing home case. So I'm not just relying upon it for our own purposes, but in the um, reasoning of a federal district court judge on the issue. Thank you. Um, the second uh, point I'd like to argue is the <clears throat> interpretation of the agreement with respect to attorney's fees and costs. The relevant language is included in paragraph 11F of the uh, agreement, and uh, the arbitrator recognized the language. The arbitrator identified that the language required him to do something, and the arbitrator refused to do it, directly contrary to what was stated in the agreement. Um, that's a manifest disregard under the three-part test that the Supreme Court recently articulated about six or seven months ago in Blondo versus Baltiera. And the three-part test is the error was obvious and capable of being readily and instantly perceived by an average person qualified to serve as an arbitrator. There's no doubt uh, Judge Stapleton is a qualified, highly qualified uh, a person of the law. Um, and he did perceive the problem instantly. He, in his own decision, he identified uh, the issue. The second part is the arbitration panel appreciated the existence of clearly governing legal principle, but decided to ignore it. And is that my time? Yeah, that looks like it's your 15 minutes. You can eat into your rebuttal time or you can you can stay with your five minutes rebuttal time. I will uh, stay with what I said. I oh. rely on my brief. Thank you. Any Curley? OK, uh, may it please your court. Stephen Curley for the Apple uh, Dominic Lemma. Uh, again, I will much like Attorney Elstein, I'll rely on my brief. Uh, and address some things that have been raised uh, so far in the argument uh, and anticipate uh, to a degree the two other points that uh, Attorney Elstein raised. Uh, with regard to the continuance request and its impact on 52.418A3, uh, one item that is in the appendix that I wanted to make particular note of, it was referenced in the brief, but it, it shows uh, as far as the appellee is concerned, the balancing that Judge Stapleton engaged in in uh, assessing this continuance request. This balancing is precisely uh, what was referred to by Judge Pearson in the decision as the uh, result of uh, 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 cases similar to two sisters in which both sides have to be considered when it comes to a continuance request. And Judge Stapleton not only granted the request in part, uh, by postponing the first day and as it turned out the only day of the arbitration until the 23rd. But he also, uh, perhaps anticipating an issue being raised with something coming up at the last minute, that other attorneys and attorney Elstein's firm should be prepared to proceed that day. Uh, there, were, uh, there were two who actually attended that hearing, attorney Rebus and attorney Woods. Attorney Rebus had been involved in the case since its outset, and as the uh, appendix reflects, he was the counsel that participated in the courtside uh, portion of this case under 52422. Uh, so to suggest that uh, either inexperienced or uninformed counsel were the only resort left to uh, the respondent uh, appellant here, uh, I think is a bit misleading. Uh, there was warning, and effectively it was warning given by Judge Stapleton in compromising the request for a continuance, and uh, the respondent was made well aware that we were going to proceed that day. Uh, when it comes to a witness uh, being referred to, and I take that take the counsel is attempting to reflect this was the prejudice 
uh, of the uh, refusal to grant the continuance in full. Uh, the witness concerned is not even referenced in the award. So from what the record reflects, uh, what if any impact that witness's testimony had uh, is uh, up to speculation. Uh, the result of all of this is that uh, Judge Stapleton uh, fully complied with his obligations as an arbitrator, as guided by uh, decisions like Two Sisters. And as uh, Judge Cradle uh, has already uh, mentioned, in, undertook that balancing test. And A071 of the appendix is the result of that process. Uh, with regard to attorney's fees uh, and the failure uh, by Judge uh, Stapleton to award any attorney's fees as some sort of evidence of manifest disregard of the, uh, of the law, one point needs to be uh, underscored that, again, is addressed in the brief. Uh, and the original uh, trial decision. The Lathuris matter, uh, the Lathuris case that's referred to uh, frequently in both the briefs and the original decision, makes it clear, and it has been built upon by the Blondo uh, test that recently, recently emerged, that as far as uh, going through the narrow uh, strictures of 52.418A4, uh, one of the factors is you have to show that the arbitrator knew the law and chose to either ignore it or warp it. Uh, what Judge Stapleton was confronted with in this case was an attorney's fees provision that, if read literally, would effectively say that the winner pays the attorney's fees. I think all of us uh, would agree that that is a rather um, unique result. And Judge Stapleton came to the conclusion that this uh, this plain language was, in all likelihood, uh, a scrivener's error rather than an effort to fee shift in such a dramatic and unprecedented way. Uh, it's worth noting that Judge Stapleton could have determined it was a Scrivener's error and had determined that the uh, most appropriate way to interpret the intent of the parties was that the winner would receive the attorney's fees and the loser would pay. He chose not to. Uh, that is uh, one of the roles of an arbitrator to make that uh, final assessment. With re uh, I would also go back that under the uh, the standards of 52.418.84 and with the precedent that was available to Judge Pearson in renting the original decision, uh, no reported case uh, had come to the point where it was determined by the court uh, in either vacating, modifying, or uh, enforcing an arbitration award that that high standard had been met. And uh, I, I pose it to the panel that uh, a situation which would have the practical result of awarding attorney's fees to the loser of an arbitration is probably uh, not anywhere near some of the closer questions that have been raised over the, uh, in the past with regard to 52.418.84. A4. Uh, was, the final excuse issue, me, um, Attorney Curley, was that, dis that um, dramatic and unprecedented fee shifting um, provision was that discussed at the arbitration in? Um, yes, like, it, yes, it was. see a transcript of the arbitration. Uh, was that discussed? Uh, it was discussed and argued uh, okay. by Attorney Woods in particular at the arbitration. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the final issue we have that uh, Attorney Elstein identified at his opening was the issue with regard to subject matter jurisdiction. Uh, as discussed in the brief, uh, your honors, what we have here is a case that did not start under uh, the prejudgment remedy statutes, but rather 52422. Uh, a prejudgment remedy that eventually was determined by stipulation was part of that case. Uh, there it, but because this arose out of an arbitration, as opposed to an anticipated civil action, there was no writ summons complaint, whether it be unsigned, signed, or in any condition. Uh, so that the application of 52278J would seem to be completely an opposite to a situation uh, like this one, which was initiated with uh, an application under 52422. Uh, I would add that even if it had impact in this matter, the consequence would be the dismissal of the prejudgment remedy. Uh, and I would further note uh, that it was uh, the respondent appellant who first came back to the court in seeking to uh, vacate or modify the award rather than the uh, appellee. 
if the logical conclusion, I at least surmise that if the, the court uh, did not have subject matter juris jurisdiction with regard to this dispute at all, uh, how could it uh, have taken up and, uh, and ruled upon both the application to uh, modify uh, and vacate the award, as well as the uh, uh, motion uh, to uh, confirm it. So with that, Your Honors, I have nothing further. I see no questions. Uh, Attorney Elstein, you have your five minutes. Thank you. With respect to the uh, attorney's fee award, there was no claim for reformation made by the plaintiff claimant. There was no proof that I'm aware of that was submitted on the intent of the parties to the agreement. Um, and there was no um, only argument was made that it shouldn't be interpreted as written. Um, the judge understood that, the arbitrator, and in his decision, he, he says that the the agreement provides that the prevailing party pays such parties' legal fees as well as the cost of the arbitration, a provision so unusual that it suggests a mistake or typing area, error. Um, there was no evidence upon which he could do that, um, and he chose affirmatively to ignore that. And I think under the three-part test under Blondo, he was required um, to... Uh, they did it prove that there was a manifest disregard because he understood it. He knew contract law um, and he decided that this provision just can't be enforced. If there had been a claim for reformation, there had been some evidence submitted uh, that might uh, have resulted um, in a different uh, posture here. But that's not what happened. So I believe that it was a manifest disregard of the law well known to the arbitrator in expressly chosen to ignore as he identified in his uh, decision. <clears throat> With respect to the subject matter jurisdiction, um, as everyone knows, we cannot confer it uh, by uh, actions. It either exists or it does not exist. Um, my filing a motion to vacate doesn't change the analysis on the subject matter jurisdiction because that is independent. So that's a, um, a poor argument, I think, for the claimant to make here. So let's focus on what the subject matter jurisdiction was or was not. As I cite in my brief in the reply brief, there is clear law that not only is the PJR dismissed, but it's the underlying case that's dismissed. And those three or four cases I cite in my papers all stand for that proposition by well-respected judges, Judge Agati, um, Judge Lee, and I'm forgetting the third right now, <clears throat> but they all concluded that the matter would be dismissed. And indeed, that's what uh, 52278J requires, is a dismissal of the case. Um, it is the claimant who decided to pursue this as a prejudgment remedy. They even entitled their papers, which you can find in the appendix at page five, application for order pedente lighting in aid of arbitration and for prejudgment remedy. Was uh, the prejudgment remedy um, amount not agreed to by your client? It was. But that, that uh, my response is that does not have an impact on what occurred thereafter. The plaintiff was the arbitration process not agreed to by your client. Was your client forced into arbitration? It was not. That was voluntary. So, what entitles your client to circle back well after the fact to have an issue with the prejudgment remedy and the fact that arbitration took place? Because it's in that case that no longer had jurisdiction that the claimant sought and was granted confirmation of the arbitration award. That case lacked jurisdiction after 30 days passed without any return to court of any documents. They didn't serve the PJR, they didn't uh, garnish or attach an asset, and they didn't return any papers to court. And under 278J, it is mandatory, shall dismiss. So your client entered into an agreement for the PJR, then your client entered into an agreement to take an alternate route and arbitrate the matter. 
And it's now your position that you're not bound by anything that your client agreed to. I, I, I don't agree with that at all. First, okay. the arbitration was commenced. Uh, voluntarily, the parties were engaging in the arbitration. The claimant then went to court for an order in aid of the pending arbitration and uh, received without objection a prejudgment remedy. That's where that stood, and that's where it stopped. They then chose to to seek confirmation in a case that wanted was wanting jurisdiction because that case didn't have jurisdiction when the claimant failed to return to court, either the order of attachment served and returned or any of the underlying papers as required. Have you had the last word, Mr. I'll just I understand the time is up and I appreciate the court's time. If there's no questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Attorney Pearlie, also. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Have a good day. Bye-bye.